hear a woman talking on the phone to a furniture company. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good afternoon, KT Furniture. Can I help you? Ah,、uh, hello. Yes. Um. I'm setting up a new office, and I don't have internet access yet. But I'd like to place an order for some furniture. That's fine. You can do it over the phone, and I can fill in the form for you this end. Oh, great! Thanks. I just need to take a few customer details first, if that's okay. Yes, fine.、Uh, what name is it? My name. Yes. Oh, it's Sue Brown.、Uh, Sue Brown. Thanks. And what's the name of your company, Miss Brown? It's a clothing company.、Uh, it's called Dress Your Best. Okay, I'll just note that down. Dress for best. No, your best. Oh right. Got it. So you make smart clothes? Yes, formal dress for weddings and special occasions. We also repair and alter clothes. I see. And where are you located? What's your postal address? Right. Well, we're on Kirby Trading Estate. Kirby. How do you spell that? It's K I R B Y. Oh, I know that area. It's New Hampton Road, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Number two hundred and ten, in South Down. Okay, and can I have a contact number for our delivery man? Sure, it's probably best if I give you my mobile number. Okay, the number's o nine three five six seven double eight five four five. Okay, double seven eight. No, seven double eight. Five four five.、Oh. Okay, that's great. Now, just a couple more questions before I take your order. Fine. We have two delivery dates this month, and you should be able to have either. When are they? Well, there's one on the sixteenth of the month, but there's a charge of forty dollars for that one. Oh, that's a lot. Hmm. Or there's option two, which is the end of the month. I'll have to confirm the date later, and that's a free delivery. I'll take option two, thanks. I don't want to pay a charge. Okay, I'll note down no charge. We haven't organised the office yet, so there should be plenty of time. Mhm.、Mm、and lastly, you don't have an account with us, so how would you like to pay? Oh, I'll pay by credit card. Okay. Will that be Visa? Is American Express okay? Absolutely fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. So, what would you like to order? Well, I've been looking in your catalogue, and you have some office chairs that look very comfortable for our type of work. Is there an item code? 
Yes, it's ASP 23. OK, those chairs come in pink, white and black. Yes, the pink looks nice, but I think the darker colour's better for us. You can see light materials on it more easily. <laughs> That's true. We'll have five of those, I think. OK, I've got that. Anything else? Do you have any striped mats? I'm sorry, not at the moment. They're out of stock. We should have some in next month. Never mind. Um, well... Um, I'd also like two of your glass desks. Oh, they're lovely, aren't they? Yes. You seem to have two sizes. Basically, large or small. I think the code for the small ones is... I think we'll have the large ones. The code here is TG586. OK. So, that's two glass desks. Any lamps for those? No. We have to get special lamps for our work. Oh, I see. Do you have another supplier for those? Yes. Um, we do need some furniture for our customers, though. OK, for a waiting area or something? Well, we have to discuss the work with them, so we need a nice sofa. Something soft and... I thought leather. Ah, yes, a good choice. There's a three-seater here, DFD44... That seems to be in red, cream or chocolate brown. Yes, it does come in yellow as well. Yellow? Hmm. I'd thought of red, but that sounds lively. Yes, I'll have that colour. I think brown's a bit too dull and cream shows the dirt too much. Yeah, you're right. Anything else? A coffee table, perhaps? Yes, I think so. Maybe TX-22, the silver one? A very good choice. Well, that's it, I think. OK, I'll just add that up for you and then take your credit card details. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 2. Section 2. You'll hear a tour guide talking to a group of visitors about Bestley Castle. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to Besley Castle. It's nice to see so many of you here today. Before we go in, I'd like to tell you some information about the castle, the things to see and do, and the facilities available to you in the grounds. We'll do our best to make this a truly memorable visit. Now... The castle grounds are quite big, and we don't want you to get lost, so I'm going to give you an idea of the layout. At the moment, we are at the entrance, and immediately to our left is the tourist information office. Go here if you need any questions answered. They'll be happy to help. And of course, behind the tourist office is the car park where the coach dropped you off and it'll also pick you up from the same spot at 5 p.m. today. In front of us are the water gardens. If you stroll through, you get to the North Bridge, which is the entrance to Besley Castle. Take your time and enjoy looking around the castle. There's a lot of history steeped in those walls. 
As you leave the castle via the south bridge, you'll be greeted with the sight of roaming deer. During the day, there will be scheduled feeding opportunities where visitors can get involved. However, we do request that you do not feed the deer outside these times. To the right of the deer park is the Castle Museum, and behind that is our award-winning restaurant. It's a relatively new addition to the castle grounds, but is fast gaining a reputation for its food. Alternatively, you can choose to dine in the picnic area on the other side of the deer park. It's perfect for the family as it's next to the kids' play area and homemade ice cream hut. We hope that on your way out, you pop into the gift shop by the exit for something to remember us by. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen. And answer questions sixteen to twenty. Admission to the grounds is free for all. That includes the museum, gardens, and picnic area. There is an admission fee for the castle, which is six pounds fifty for adults, with a ten percent discount for students and retired people. Children under the age of sixteen pay half adult price, and under eight go in free. There are many spectacular events throughout the year, and for most of them, there is also an admission fee. As these events are in high demand, it's a good idea to book well in advance. Some of the exciting events planned for this year are the Summer Medieval Festival, where you can watch old-fashioned knights and experience a feast in the halls of the castle, as if you were a guest of King Henry the Eighth himself. There are several concerts planned this year too, including a rock concert, at an admission price of ten pounds per person, and a special jazz concert, which is free to the public. I'm sure you'll agree that all tastes and ages will be satisfied. One scary but extremely popular event is the annual haunted castle event at the end of October, where the castle comes alive at night. Why don't you come along if you're brave enough? Another sight to see is the fantastic firework display on November fifth, and the cost of that includes refreshments. We also have a long tradition of raising money for charity. The charity event held every year on the first day of May will this year be an archery contest. Entrance is free, but donations are certainly welcome. This year. We'll be collecting money on behalf of a charity for elderly people, age concern. Just in case you can't remember all of that, you can pick up a leaflet showing the timetable and prices for all events from the tourist information desk. You can also go online to get this information from our website. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Track twenty-two, section three. You will hear a tutor and a student discussing a seminar. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Come in. Hi. Oh, hello, Ahmed. How are you? Fine, thanks. Have a seat. <clears throat> so, how do you think the seminar went last week? Oh, well, I enjoyed it, yes, though I'm not sure I really followed parts of the discussion that took place. <laughs> you know, about the theory and all that. Well, we can talk about that later. But were you comfortable in a group? Oh, it's better, I think, than working on your own, though you're comparing yourself all the time with the other students there. <laughs> OK. Well, let's talk about how you did and look at some strategies to help you in the future. That would be great. Now, one of the things that students often overlook when they go to seminars is that you do need to prepare for them. You can't rely on other people. I know, and I did look at the results of the experiments we did in class and write them up beforehand, as you said. Yes, and that was good. It made it easier to analyze them. But you have to do some background reading as well. Did you get the list of articles I sent round? Mm -hmm. I started to read them. Okay, well, you'll know that for next time. Yes, yes, sure. So, let's move on to your participation in the seminar. Right. Perhaps you can tell me how you think that went. Yeah, well, I'm not used to talking to more than a couple of people. It's very different from the way we learn in my home country. Yes, I appreciate that. So I think I, um, well, I know I should have included everyone, but I think I kept turning to the person next to me. <laughs> Is that because you were avoiding eye contact? I don't think so. I'm not shy. It's just habit, I think. Well, that will improve as we do more seminars. Uh-huh. Um, another difficulty is knowing when to speak. Like when it's your turn? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I felt I did wait for a pause. Yes, you handled that quite well. The thing I'm really concerned about is keeping up with the discussion. Ah, does your mind wander off? Sometimes. I jot down a lot of information... But I still find myself thinking about something else when lots of other students are talking. Hmm. If there's an assignment to do at the end of a group, that usually helps. <laughs> I'm sure it does. OK. Now, the last thing I want to look at is the role that you play in the seminar. What do you mean? Well, when students work in groups, they don't all behave the same way. Some students are quiet, some look for support, some ask a lot of questions. Oh, that's a new idea to me. I don't know what I'm like. That's probably because you're thinking about your own performance all the time. I guess so. I mean, should I be different in some way? What I would say is that when we do the next seminar, you should look more at the people around you. You know, look outside yourself. Like ask myself how they feel? Yes, or what they're looking for from the group. OK. It doesn't take much, but it's important to watch what other students are doing. OK, I'll do that. Fine. Now, I'm going to suggest... Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Now, I'm going to suggest a couple of strategies for next week's seminar. OK. That's great. I need to participate more. Well, it's not a question of saying more, but we need everyone to feel comfortable about giving their views. Then the discussion is better. Yes. So... You're a confident person. 
Should I make sure I'm near someone who's quiet? You can do, but it's more about how well you pay attention to other students. Okay, so I need to be attentive. Yes, and then encourage someone else to say more by saying, What did you mean when you said, or what do you think about the idea that... That way I'm talking. Yes, but you'll find that other people will talk too. You'll all start to get really involved. Right. They're good suggestions. The other thing that can really help is the way you take notes. Yeah, I, I know I write down everything, but I should be stricter with myself. Well, you actually need to think a few days ahead. Really? <laughs> yes. What's the topic? And what's the best way of making notes? I see. So I have a strategy when I walk in the room. Exactly. Mm. Then when you read through them later, they'll make sense, and you won't have to write them out again. <laughs> I always have to do that. The other thing I would say is that you should include a small column in your notes where you can jot down things you want to go back to before the seminar ends. Like a reminder? Yes. Notes aren't just for later. You can use them as a prompt when there's a pause in the discussion. That's been really helpful. Okay. See you in class tomorrow. Thanks. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You'll hear a man giving a lecture on nuclear fusion. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 33. I'd like to start by thanking so many of you for attending this, my first public lecture at this magnificent university. I'm going to be talking to you today about nuclear fusion. Before I proceed further, I would like to apologize on behalf of some of our newspapers for the sensationalist and hopelessly inaccurate articles that have been published on the subject over the years. I must confess that my own interest in the subject was actually stimulated by an article published more than 50 years ago in a popular Sunday tabloid with the impressive title Power from the Sea. Today, most people would probably interpret such a title as an introduction to a discussion on the latest developments in renewable energy sources, such as wave technology or generating electricity from tidal flows. But back then, little, if any, progress had been made in these fields since the invention of the water wheel. As I recall, following coverage of the opening of the world's first commercial nuclear power station more than 50 years ago now at calder hall in 1956 the article promised that we would have limitless almost free electricity within 10 years it claimed that we could do this using an isotope of water deuterium from the sea this would be used in reactors to combine simple molecules of hydrogen to form helium, releasing energy in the process. Of course, this is different from the process of nuclear fission, which today's nuclear reactors use. I wouldn't like to say that the article I read as a boy was totally inaccurate. It's true that the concept of producing energy from nuclear fusion, essentially reproducing the reactions by which our sun and other stars produce energy, depends on fusing atoms of hydrogen, but the timescale suggested was hopelessly wrong. 
To this day, despite some very embarrassing false claims from scientists who should have known better, we have not been able to produce energy from nuclear fusion in a controllable way. Let me make clear what I mean by this statement, before some journalist in the audience gets hold of the wrong end of the stick. Yes, we have been able to fuse hydrogen atoms to produce helium and a release of energy, but the balance account has always been negative. We've always had to put more energy into the reaction than we've ever succeeded in getting out. We know the theory works, but we still do not know if we can get fusion to work for us and solve the problem of our energy needs. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 34 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 34 to 40. Here, I will briefly explain these problems before going on to give you a summary of the innovative ways being tested to overcome them. First of all, we have to try to understand the incredible physical conditions that exist inside a natural nuclear fusion reactor, such as the Sun. To start with, we have to create temperatures never experienced on our planet. Indeed, if we had experienced the temperatures required, then our planet would never have formed. We have to generate temperatures of at least 100 million degrees Celsius in a carefully controlled environment before we can even hope to produce a fusion reaction. The problems are immense, but it can be done. Many of you will know that you can put your hand into a very hot oven and not get burnt, provided you do not touch any of the surfaces. I won't go into the reasons for this phenomenon here, but we are applying roughly the same principles in designs for fusion reactors. I think I can promise you that the heat will be confined to a very small area. The other major problem we have to find a solution to is pressure. The pressures in a massive body like the Sun are vast, and this is what brings the hydrogen atoms into such close proximity to one another that they fuse into helium. We may not have to achieve the same pressures in a fusion reactor, but even so, it is a huge technological problem. What, then, makes me hopeful about the future of energy from nuclear fusion? Perhaps surprisingly, it is developments in laser technology. We can now use lasers to control the nuclear fuel pellets so that they remain suspended inside the reactor without touching the sides. Remember that these pellets are quite small, and because they contain atoms of deuterium and tritium, the two isotopic forms of hydrogen that can be used in these reactions, they are quite light. The lasers will also compress the fuel pellet to raise the pressure to that required to initiate the fusion reaction. Another, far more powerful laser will be used to heat the fuel pellet to the temperature required. This laser, if you like, will act as the trigger to start the reaction. Once started, it is hoped that the reaction will produce enough energy to maintain itself, and also that it will produce a surplus in the form of heat that can be used to produce the steam needed to drive turbines in order to generate the electricity the world needs. To give you some idea of how much energy we can produce, it has been calculated that just one kilogram of fusion fuel is capable of producing the same amount of energy as 10,000 tons of fossil fuel. I think you would agree that such an objective is worth working towards. I believe, and I am not alone in this, that nuclear fusion could supply the world's energy needs for centuries to come. That is the end of section four. You now have...